I'm Margaret Vanastelli Gardner, editor in chief of Fundraising Success Magazine, and I am the host for today's ha hangout. I almost said hook up. Sorry, that was inappropriate. <laughs> no, this is our hangout, and uh, you may be able to tell that this is my very first one. Uh, and boy, am I not comfortable watching myself talk, but I'll get over it. And I don't think I have to do anything technical, so we should be okay. Uh, as you all know, we are here to introduce the Essential Fundraising Handbook for Small Nonprofits. It was recently published and written by a really terrific group of um, talented and knowledgeable fundraising professionals. And lucky us, we have some of them here with us now. So I think rather than take up any more of their time, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Um, let's start with Mark. Why don't you each tell us your name, uh, what you do, and tell us a little bit about your individual chapter that you wrote in the book. Great. Well, thanks so much, Margaret. It's uh, my name is Mark Pittman. Mark is cram spelled backwards, and you can see that <laughs> on your screen. Uh, the um, my fundraisingcoach.com is kind of where I hang out online. Um, I love asking for money. I think it's the coolest thing that we can do. So the chapter that I wrote was on uh, major gift fundraising because that's. I know all of the chapters are the most important. I totally get that. So I'll tell you why mine is the most important in the context of most important chapters because it is the essential book. So this is for everyone. Um, what I love about major gifts is that you can develop really deep relationships with donors in ways that are mutually beneficial and not just gimmicky mutually beneficial but you can really help people invest in your organization as you're investing in, in them. And uh, it's also a great way to raise a lot of money quickly. That a lot of the other methods uh, may take some more time or have different track records with. So I love asking for money. That's what I do. How about you, Sherry? Should we go to Sherry? We can go to Sherry. Absolutely. Sherry, you're on. <laughs> um, I'm Sherry Truler with Red Apple Auctions, and my particular specialty in this area has to do with fundraising auctions. Uh, I'm about one inch wide and two miles deep when it comes to auctions, so I'm I'm really excited to be with other people in the presentation of this book who have a lot more expertise in other areas of fundraising. But like Mark, I will agree with you, Mark. It is about asking, and one of the things that I think is is unique with regards to auctions and fundraising because auctions very often are the largest fundraising event of a nonprofit. But what's interesting is that many times when people get started, in the case of like with an auction where they're volunteering their time, they start by asking for items. And if you're dealing with volunteers who are helping on behalf of a nonprofit, or maybe it's someone who's just getting started in the, in the space, um, sometimes the ask is scary at first, but they start with small asks, asking for gifts in kind that are then sold in an auction, and they can certainly work their way up into uh, those big time, big asks, direct asks that uh, that you were referring to, Mark. So, um, so that's really my expertise is working with those auctions, silent live games, raffles, funded needs, everything that's related to the fundraising event specifically that a lot of nonprofits do as a sort of a, a portion of their fundraising event um, journey. So, yay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yay, okay. Is it all right if I just keep moving along, Margaret? Yeah, I was going to say, Kristen, how about you? Okay. Okay, great. My name is Kirsten Bullock, and I'm the founder of the Nonprofit Academy, where I try to connect people with resources and tools and information to help them succeed. And I especially focus on small and, and mid-sized nonprofits. My contribution to the book was the chapter on awareness, because if people don't know about an organization, they're not going to give to it. Just like if we don't ask for a donation, people generally don't give it. So the overview of the chapter is really focusing on where the strengths of the organization are already in relation to awareness and then making the most of them, choosing the strategies and tools that will work best for them specifically and not trying to come up with one generic fits-all solution. Gail? Great. Last but not least, I'm Gail Gifford. I'm president of Cause and Effect, Inc. We work with nonprofits in a whole range of capacity building, from fundraising to board development to strategic planning, so all ways to help strengthen the organization. I spend a lot of my time working with board members, and that's my chapter in the book. So it seems that our 
profession, our sector, has an obsession with this question of how do I get my board members to fundraise? And that's what my chapter is about, how to do it and how not to do it. Okay. Great. Um, before we get into some questions, I want to, Mark, since you introduced me to the book, I'm going to address this to you, but anybody else can, can jump in when you like. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, or tell us a little bit about um, the thinking behind the book and, and why you thought it was important to, to do it now? Well, I definitely want other, everybody else's help with this, but um, <laughs> for, I, um, there's, there are a bunch of us that are really, okay, so I'm going to talk about everybody else but not me. They're really good at what they do. Um, and so And we, we love what we do and we could all talk about it you know, forever. And when we're kind of, I think we're um, hanging out, either it was a Google Hangout or something, something online where we just thought, what if we each got together and kind of distilled one of our areas of expertise for the small nonprofit and created a book? Did I get that right, you guys? Indeed, yes, Mark. And you know, the other thing too is there's not a lot of resources out there for very small, one, you know, small development shops. So that seemed like a a good area to kind of address because when you're trying to do it all and where should you focus, uh, you want to have a resource to that. So that was really the focus on that area. But you're right, we were hanging out together in Facebook and other social media sites. Okay, um, I know that there are numerous chapters and they all focus on different topics, but one more general question uh, that I will throw out to any of you. What is the overall, I guess, message or key point that you would like readers to leave, you know, finish reading this book with. And when they walk away from it, what do you want them to think, feel, do? How? What is the reaction you're looking for? I'd love them to feel capable and competent and fearless about going out and raising money. That it's not yes. something mystifying, something they need to be frightened of, but that they have the tools and they can put it to work and they can be successful and and like it and enjoy it. Kirsten, what about you? I would say that there, um, there is no one-size-fits-all. So a lot of times, small nonprofits, they look at the big guys and say, oh, wow, if only we could do this or that. And a lot of times, the strategies just won't work for the small nonprofit. And there's a lot of strengths that small nonprofits bring to the table, mostly around being able to build individual relationships and, and to be comfortable where they are and confident like Gail said, that they can make a difference and, and have a big impact using the strengths that they specifically bring to the table. Okay. Uh, Kirsten, uh, I'm, for, I'm, I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, just Mark. a verbal extrovert. Um, my <laughs> <laughs> What I really hope people get from this is the, uh, the sense that they, it's going to be okay. They're not the only ones that are going through needing to raise money for a nonprofit because a lot of small nonprofits in particular, people get into it because of the cause and then they find out that they have to fund the cause. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to feed the hungry or clothe the, the, those needing clothes. I almost said naked, but I'm not sure that's okay in some areas. Um, it, they wanted to do that stuff and they found out there's this fundraising thing. And so I, what I love about having vision and grants and chapters on boards, chapters on the charity auctions, all the different chapters that are on in here, how to write a fundraising letter, that sort of thing, is uh, I feel like it's a one-stop shop for people to be able to actually feel like, oh, there's a tool that I can keep right on my desk, and when my board asks me how do we do this, I can say, let me get back to you, and pull out the book and quickly look through it to the right chapter. Sherry, how about you? Uh, confidence. If, if they were going to take away one thing, it would be confidence. I think that's been kind of I'm reiterating what's been already stated. But to me, if you've got the confidence to do it, you'll figure it out one way or the other. And this book gives you some tools to make that happen. Great. Um, Kristen, I want to go back to something that you said. You mentioned that uh, small nonprofits have skills and, and they do have a lot to offer and they do have things that they can work with. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? Because I know when I speak to smaller nonprofits, and, and I'm sure you've all had the same <coughs> excuse me, experience, they feel like, well, like you said, we can't do the same thing that the ASPCA does, or we can't do the same thing that another gargantuan organization does. But what, what, what do they bring? Are they more nimble? Are they more open to change? Like how, how would you define that? I would definitely say more nimble and more open to change. With large organizations, it's like trying to steer a, a battleship 
and trying to turn it around when they need to change direction. But for small nonprofits, it's it's more like a sailboat where you're more nimble, more able to um, make changes quickly. But the biggest strength that I see with small nonprofits is because they're small, they're not trying to deal with a database of 100,000 people. It might be dealing dealing with, that's probably the wrong word, but communicating, building relationships with the database of maybe a thousand people. And that's much more manageable. You can be a lot more intimate with that size group of people. And um, there's a lot of strength that comes from being able to do that. There's a lot more strategies that can be used when you're looking at a small group of people that you're communicating with rather than huge databases with lots of systems and processes. It's easy in those cases for people to feel like they're just a cog in a wheel rather than a real special integral part of the organization. Okay. Um, and to follow, if I could just jump in on that, um, a lot of small nonprofits are embedded deeply in their local community. So they have a place or they have, if not a place that people can go to and visit, you can see often the results of their work. So there's a really close connection potential between that organization and its donors. Um, and even as, as Kirsten was saying, in the small donor base, they might be your family or friends or your next door neighbors. I mean, they're connections to you. They're not some you know, unknown, um, disembodied name in a giant base, but they're real, real living people that you could actually touch even in many cases. That's great. Does anyone want to add to that before we move on to another question? Okay. Gail, I'm going to stick with you um, because this is something, your, your area of expertise is something that we really, really do get a lot of questions about at Fundraising Success. And um, like you said, everybody wants to know how to engage your board. Everybody wants to know how to get them over their fear or if not fear of fundraising, uh, aversion to fundraising. What would be your advice? So I am a complete heretic in the um, nonprofit world because I don't start from the belief that it's a board's member's job to fundraise. Now, let me go back because before everybody starts sending the arrows my way, um, I think that it's really important for us all to understand what's the way that we bring revenues into our organization. Different organizations have different models of revenue generation. If your organization depends on giving from individuals or local businesses or bigger businesses and even foundations and you need that personal connection and engagement, then what you want to do as a small shop fundraiser, of course, is to both mobilize all the people assets that you have to reach out. And so your board members become really sort of juicy targets for helping you along. But what happens with most nonprofits is that the development, whether it's a development director or the executive director, whoever the staff person is in that organization, is that they think, oh, it's that person's job. And therefore, because they got that job, they have to do this, even if they know absolutely nothing about how to do it, if they even thought it was their job when they started, if they you know, they have tremendous fears about it, and they really don't have any sense of what all the options are available to them. So I start from this place of don't assume that it's somebody's job, but figure out then how you create a willing partner if you don't start from that place where you assume it's their job. Um, and sticking with the with the topic of boards, um, how how do you get them? engaged, I mean obviously engagement is the key to every part of the relationship in, in fundraising. So how do you get board members engaged and how do you keep them interested so that they really are active parts and not just a name on a on the piece right. of paper? So from a from a fundraising perspective and from a small shop, you know, first of all you have to get to know these people because they're human beings. My friend Deb Beck says board members are not seats. They're human beings, and we have to really treat them that way. So spending time figuring out what they care about, what they want to, to have happen to be successful, why they're involved with your cause, how they would like to contribute. We really, really need to start with where they are to move them along. And then, just like we would for, you know, as Mark talks about in, in working with a major giver, and any giver is to figure out what the development plan is for that individual. 
does that board member maybe need a transformational experience in your organization to really build their passion, to really set them on fire so that they want to go out and be an evangelist? You know, what is it that they need? Maybe they just need for you to help them and coach them a little bit. Maybe they need some very specific kind of training. Maybe they like to read and figure things out that way. But it's really designing something customized to each individual. Now, I know the book addresses small nonprofits. Um, so let's talk really small or really new, say. Let's talk about a nonprofit that doesn't really have a board in place yet. Um, what, would you, what would be your best advice for, for starting out with your board and getting them in place and, and working with them? Oh, so if I'm the, the founder of the organization and pulling my board together, mm -hmm. I think I want to go out and find people who are going to be just as passionate as I am about the issue. Mm -hmm. I think the mistake that a lot of organizations make is they just sort of draft every family member that they can possibly find or, you know, neighbor or friend. Um, and not that the, those aren't great people and they may be really loyal to you, but they tend to feel like they're just helping you out. Um, and maybe they don't want to do a lot of things, they're just there so that you had enough people that mm -hmm. you could be aboard. But I would really go search for the people who are going to be partners with you in building this organization and really want to make it happen together. That's where I would start at the beginning. And do you recommend, uh, this question probably answers itself, but do you recommend that there's a very clear-cut list of responsibilities that, and expectations of the board so that they know what is expected of them? I think it's important for every board um, to craft that and I you know, like to think of there's the things that the board has to do as a board and its governing role, setting direction, making sure the organization is, is worthy and trustworthy of people's support, that it's doing good work, that it's having an impact. And then there's what are the other expectations we have from these individual board members who are leadership volunteers? What are the expectations we have of them? And those the board needs to have a conversation together about what that is and how it adds value to the organization at whatever stage of its life that organization might be at. And you know that role may change as an organization matures, as it grows, if it ever develops professional staff. Um, it really is customized. There isn't any one way of doing a board. There's what's the right way for this organization at this place and time to where it needs to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Sherry, let's pop over to you. Um, we have a question about silent auctions versus live auctions. Can you um, address that when would one be a better option than the other? Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question and it's a common question for that matter. Um, I think many times people that are doing a live auction will automatically include a silent auction as part of the festivities of the particular event, but silent auctions are much more uh, popular. And the reason that silent auctions are much more popular is for several reasons. Number one, I think that most people are afraid of a live auction because it, it seems like it might be more work. Um, certainly it does take up more time in a program because you need to set aside time for the auctioneer to actually sell. So if you are in a situation where you've got an incredibly tight program um, and you still want to have some sort of an auction feel, the silent auction is going to have to be the way to go because you don't want to take time out for the auctioneer to actually speak. Uh, the other time that it can be useful is if you've got a really diverse setting. So for instance, I'm thinking some of the zoo fundraisers that I've been involved with, perhaps uh, an arboretum for instance, where they've got people that are coming in to enjoy a day, maybe it's a carnival even, um, but people are dispersed and there's never a time to actually bring them together and focus them well, then a silent auction is going to be a better way to go as well. Um, and thirdly, if it's taking place over a series of days, so for instance, if you're doing a conference, uh, that would be a, a, an appropriate time for a silent auction too, simply because you can't bring people together. There's never a time where you're bringing them together uh, to hear the, the live auction environment. So if you're, if you're finding yourself in those situations, that's where you're going to head towards the silent. Okay. Um, I do have some more questions about auctions, but I want to remind everybody to uh, please ask some questions using the hashtag essential fundraising. Is that right, Mark? That's right. Okay, good. Uh, so please <laughs> well send us your questions. Um, okay, Sherry, you were, what about the idea of online auctions? How do they fit in to the whole 
it's it's another strategy it's absolutely another strategy that one of the wonderful things that's happening in the benefit auction industry over the last five years has been this infusion of technology I should say 10 years because online auctions really started a little over 10 years ago but this infusion of technology on ways to change how we're doing things um, most recently that's getting into electronic and mobile bidding in the silent auction area but that has since merged we're seeing tremendous mergers and acquisitions amongst the various vendors out there that used to do online auctions and these used to do mobile bidding and now they're all doing and competing against one another uh, so online auctions would be a strategy that would be employed as a way to raise money and when you utilize that well, again, it's a bit like the silent versus live question. We've got some people who, for their annual fundraiser, are doing live, silent, online, uh, sometimes the online auctions before and after. So, um, and then other times, uh, uh, one of my uh, SPCA clients up in New Hampshire does a phenomenal job with online auctions. They will have something that's come in, for instance, we'll say two seats to an upcoming game or a concert that's been donated. Well, the fundraiser isn't happening for six months. We can't wait. It's going to, the concert will be over by then. But they will put that into an online auction environment, sell that, turn that into cash, which is really what the nonprofit needs to do their work turn it into cash to help the SPCA up there and uh, that's how the, the online auction is utilized in that way. So it's all just different uh, different toes on the same foot you might say. Um, we have a question, uh, I guess this, this would be for live auctions. How do you get people to actually bid? <laughs> bid? <laughs> <laughs> There's sure not usually a problem with people bidding. You know, maybe maybe that question is, um, you know, sometimes the qu I, I really I really don't have this problem with it. Um, I suppose if there could be a culture issue where, okay, let me let me address it. Maybe it's maybe it's coming from that point. Um, for instance, um, in the United States, I would say. I can't say that there's generally a problem with people bidding in a live auction and certainly if there is an issue then that's up to the auctioneer to adjust the price because um, you want to you want to bring people in and ideally the interesting thing is is apparently I've never actually read this study but I have been told this and I think I saw references to it so it's I haven't read the actual study but eBay had done a study that looked at where you start the bids in an auction and what they found is that if you started we'll say a car you know the car is going to sell for five ten thousand dollars but if you started at 99 cents you'll actually make more money than if you started at a hundred dollars both are cheap for a car, but the 99 cents drew people in because of the psychology that's involved with auctions, and auctions are filled with psychology. The thinking on this, and I'll go back to my auction school days, is that when you're able to start a price that everybody can get involved, even people who weren't initially interested are now becoming interested. So if I have in this instance the car and I'm starting it at 99 cents I'll raise my hand to get involved now I'm invested and suddenly anyone who bids against me it's now my car I wasn't even interested in the car at first but now that I'm bidding I've become invested so because of that that's part of why the auction works so well is to get because people become um, invested in it and one of the activities they had us do at auction school was we would go to an an auction, a small auction, and find some very small piece that we were committed to buying. They wanted us to feel that anxiety that we feel inside. Once that item comes up to the podium, the auctioneer starts to sell it and we know we're in it to win it. And you do become very hyper and anxious about making sure that you're the winning bidder and it's amazing how much more you're willing to go because want that item so in that sense it would be up the auctioneer to lower the price to get the get get the people invested in it but the other thing I wanted to address just briefly is there could be a culture difference um, years ago I worked with a Vietnamese community on one side of the room for the most part were people that were over the age of 50 we'll say and for 40 maybe more over here were people that were 40 and under everybody who was 40 and under all of my bids came from that side of the house not the right side and afterwards I talked to the organizer about this and he said well in in our culture you wouldn't want to raise your hand and I be identified at all that would be a bad thing to be identified and so I think to some extent there isn't maybe an American culture around that that you know it's like yes I'm in it 
I'm here, present. <laughs> um, whereas maybe in other cultures, uh, it's and benefit auctions are more prevalent in the United States, for that matter. Maybe in other cultures, it's more like, no, don't pick me. I'm one of the crowd. I don't want to be seen, and it may be a bad thing for me to be seen. So hopefully that addresses mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are so many things that could easily not even come to someone's mind, like something like that. They might not even think of something like that. So it, it could be the wrong items. I mean, it, it could be the wrong items. It could be the wrong crowd for the items. I mean, but but it is inevitably it's up to that auctioneer to start getting the bids, whether you're saying something or dropping that price or whatever. We like to say it doesn't matter where you start the bidding. It matters where you end the bidding. <laughs> and if we had to start everything at 99 cents, you know, sometimes I'll joke about this is, you know, I can get to a million dollars counting by ones if we need to do that. <laughs> can get to a million dollars. It'll take a little longer, but we can get there. So, um, I read something. Gee, where was it? Maybe Fundraising Success Magazine. I've but, heard that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but it gave me. It was a. It was a story that that someone wrote for us about auctions, and it gave me such a an aha moment. I thought, wow, this makes so much sense. Um, someone had written that, you know, if you have somebody who is bidding on an item, and they win it. There's somebody else who was just as ready to spend almost as much, that person who comes in second, oh, and that sure. by not having some sort of a, a backup plan for them, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Is that a, a key point that you think people should remember? That, that is, and that falls into live auctions, which I just will address, is not, is not really addressed in the book, it's more silent, but it is an important point, so I'll, I'll address it, is in a live auction setup, the way that we're structuring that live auction should really be set up on a bell curve. Um, it's it's you want to have your most exciting item kind of in the middle that peak of the auction to your point because there's going to be people behind that item that you sell for ten thousand dollars that are willing to spend that so what are you going to offer them instead now there are other ways to get that money it doesn't have to be through a live auction environment it can be through a fund a need uh, which is where we ask people to raise their hand and make a pledge to the cause and there's got it's got its own psychology built into that too but you certainly do not where a lot of beginners make their mistake is they'll have you know ten items and their most ex exclusive ex interesting item and most expensive item is the last one and that's like who thought that up that's horrible you want to peek it you don't want to put it at the end you really do want to create that bell curve okay great um gosh all of these topics are something we could all talk about for an hour each but we'll move on mark let's talk about major gifts um, what <clears throat> do you find that there is a hesitation amongst fundraisers maybe especially with smaller nonprofits with actually getting down and dirty with potential donors and, and getting up close and personal. Do you find that that's something that a lot of uh, people need to work on and get over? Definitely. Um, I think part of it, something in the way you worded it got me thinking differently about this, but uh, part of it is how we deal with money. Um, when we're, a lot of us in the nonprofit space um, just have issues with money that we don't even realize. I had two business owners come to me once when I started fundraising coach. They were totally separate instances on the same day, and they were both livid when they found out what I did, um, because they're the nonprofits in their community had gone to them with this kind of Robin Hood mentality of we're going to steal from you because you're for profit, you're filthy, you're in it for the filthy lucre, and we're going to make you acceptable socially by letting you give to us. And there was a sense of entitlement, which I think was actually a mask for fear. They were just afraid about how to handle money, and they didn't understand it. They didn't know why they needed it. And um, so there is definitely hesitation right from a base level, and it comes from their family of origin. It comes from your faith tradition. It comes from your own personal finances. Um, but then there's also just if they reject me with the gift, is it rejecting me, especially for small nonprofits? because we usually kind of clothe ourselves in our mission. Uh, and how could nobody, and so this may be you know, jumping ahead of a question, I don't know, but one of the things that uh, we need to remember in small nonprofits is that our universe orbits around our nonprofit, but our donor's universe doesn't. And so that's why we need to get clear with our messaging. We need to figure out what we're asking for. We can't just say, will you support our cause? Because we know how much we need. They don't have any clue. Um, 
and that's why we um, need to try to speak their language. When we start talking our own language, act, I'm right now uh, on site at a hospital in New Hampshire that's not necessarily a small nonprofit, but still there's a lot of the same things where there's acronyms and inside lingo and, and stuff that if an outsider from the street were to come and listen to some of the, the people talking, they, it's a foreign language. Um, and each of our small nonprofits can get that way too. So that, but we hide behind that because um, it makes us feel like we are a better investment because we we know our stuff. And donors aren't so worried about that as much as the personal connection. Um, can I keep going? Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what I think what helps overcome the fear is when you realize it's not about you. It's about taking a donor and their values and their interests and their life goals and finding a place over here where you can plug those into in your nonprofit. Uh, when I when I do trainings I usually talk about the our nonprofits being like an electrical cord and uh, being our nonprofits a wall of outlets and then the donor is an electrical cord and we just get to walk up and down the wall of outlets and figure out what are the different aspects of what we do that this person's interested in. What would she most jive with? What What is the, the thing that she's most interested in? Unfortunately, we get so, usually we put off the ask, so we get stressed because the cash isn't coming in, uh, and we get scared about asking, so we just try to jam them into whatever project we're trying to do now, even if they clearly have said, I'm not interested in cats at all, I'm a dog person, I don't care, I want you to help fund our spay and neuter, you know, spay and neutering cats, they're going to say no. But if there's, a, we need to be listening a lot to hearing what they're, what people are interested in, and that takes the pressure off. That's the beauty part. You can start asking them their story, and it doesn't become about nearly as much about you as it does about them. And it becomes less personal, so you don't really, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't have to fear the rejection if it comes. You, you gotta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I've been at this for a couple decades, and I still got to pull on my big boy pants <laughs> and remind myself <laughs> that they didn't reject me. They're not saying that you know I'm not going to just go out and eat worms. They're not. <laughs> there's nothing there. It's it isn't about me. It's about their value, and I didn't. Perhaps I didn't communicate our value in a way that they understood. Uh, perhaps the timing really isn't right, uh, but. Most the best part for having been in this this industry through recessions and everything is that no's for now are usually just no's for now. Even the ones that write you off and how dare you expletive expletive come and ask me, um, which hardly ever happens. I was gonna <laughs> say, Mark. <laughs> I just saw some people just freak out like, oh no! Um, I've only had that happen a couple of times, um, and that's with it, it, that was in the beginning when there was just really bad planning. But um, even those people, there, I you know, had one person pull the gift um, because he got twisted with something that was going on. But um, 18 months later, was able to make a, a gift, I think, over 10 times bigger than the gift he pulled. It, most of us are all on a journey. And so when a donor says no for now, usually there's plenty of opportunity for us, especially in small nonprofits. We're going to bump into them in the grocery store. We're going to see them in the park or whatever. So um, there's opportunities to keep keep the relationship going, which always leads to an ask. <laughs> um, Mark, I want to go back to something that you said in a webinar that we did previously, which I loved, and everybody else on the webinar loved. I hope it was you who said it, and I apologize. <laughs> I'll wrong. take it if it were. <laughs> brilliant, so take credit for it. Oh, I'll take you. <laughs> Once, I believe it was you who said one of the biggest mistakes that major gift fundraisers make during uh, a meeting with a potential donor is to talk themselves out of the gift. Do you remember what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you follow up on that? Sure. Um, the since I've already said naked in the, earlier in the in the hangout, um, it's, I call it verbal diarrhea. We get to this <laughs> point. The there's so much that's not. It doesn't have to be about us. The four steps that I talk about in the chapter, and when I teach major gift fundraising, I use the term get real. Uh, R stands for research. We have to research our prospect and research our, our, our research our project and then research our prospect. Engage. E is engage. Get to know them. Get them. Let them get to know us. A is ask. If we did nothing else and we just asked, we at least get some money in. And L is love uh, or live with their response or like them. It gets a little loosey, loosey goosey. But the ask is the only part in the whole process where it's totally out of our control. 
Um, I don't think it's a legitimate ask if you, unless you ask them for a specific project or dollar amount. I, I favor dollar amounts. Uh, and I like to say I'd like to, you to consider $1,000, not $84 a month. Because what you're doing in the solicitation when you're asking for a major gift is you're putting yourself on uh, everything else has been you guys are buds. You're together, you're partnering, you're feeling good, you're talking mission, vision, values. Now you're putting them on the spot and saying, okay, I want you to invest in what we're doing. And so I want that big dollar amount out there. Would you consider, and you know, whatever the big dollar amount is for you. I was just doing a training in, in DC and some organizations, $500 was a major gift and some organizations in the room, half a million dollars was the first level of their major gift. So it's an elastic term, so just put whatever it is, but I'll say 1000 So, you know, Margaret, would you consider giving $1,000 to our cause this year? The only role for the fundraiser at that point is to shut up. <laughs> Usually, if you're a verbal extrovert like me, or just totally uncomfortable because you put somebody on the spot, you'll say, Margaret, I'd like to, you to consider, would you, give a, would, you, would you give us a gift of $1,000 this year? And you don't even let it go for a beat, and you say, or... You know, that's like $84 a month or, you know, whatever you could give would be great. Um, you know what? I'm just going to pay the check now and I'm, I'm going <laughs> to leave because I'm really embarrassed. And let's, let's pretend this didn't even happen, okay? Uh, yeah, so we just, if we shut up, we save ourselves from talking them out of the gift. And here's the psychology in it that I figured out um, is that you've just asked them to do something they've presumably never done up until this point. You need to respect them enough to let them think it through. Margaret, would you give a, consider giving a gift of $1,000? All of a sudden, gears start going, and the donor prospect will let you know they're done processing by being the first to speak. But it's the scariest part, because it feels like you've just jumped off a cliff, and you have no clue if there's really water under there or if you're going to just smack <laughs> hit a rock at all. So yeah, tie, the, 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 I was the one who mentioned that, talking ourselves right out of a gift. <laughs> Margaret, I'd like to say that all those things that Mark was talking about for engage, you know, research and engagement and loving are also critical things for getting your board members to participate and be effective fundraisers. I mean, you, you know, first and foremost, you need to get them to be donors and to be donors with a real stake in the organization at a leadership level. So that's the wonderful thing about this book is that the chapters just intertwine with each other and you can carry lessons from one chapter to the next. Okay. And um, since since Gail did mention the book, I'm just going to essentialfundraising.com. Uh, no, essentialfundraisinghandbook.com. Oh, man, I, I blew it. <laughs> essentialfundraisinghandbook.com if you want more information. Back to you, Margaret. Okay. Um, <laughs> Kristen, let's talk about your area of expertise. And I know that something that, that we are hearing over and over and over again is the debate over branding. And you can have uh, one nonprofit professional or consultant say branding is the be all and the end all and if you if you don't have a strict brand uh, formula <coughs> or format then you're screwed and then someone else will say well actually branding can hurt your fundraising so how, how would you address that? I would look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and equate branding to maybe the second or third level rather than the first level for small nonprofits, the most important thing is to build relationships, get their name out in the community, and get some money in. So in my mind, I would not say that branding is one of the first things that a small nonprofit needs to work on. And especially if one is just, um, just getting started, their mission, their vision, their idea of who they are, it's probably going to change some in the first couple mm -hmm. years. So I know that there's a lot of people who would disagree with me, but I think that's Branding is one of those things that's a good thing at some point, but it's not the first do all and be all for small nonprofits that are really just getting started. And I think that your response um, addresses an issue that, that we could follow up on. And a lot of people are not even clear of, you know, is there a difference between awareness and branding? And I think I probably showed my ignorance, but when I would, I guess when I, when I first heard nonprofits talking about branding, I just kind of thought that that was the same thing as, as making themselves, creating awareness for themselves and their mission among their community. So um, how would you describe what you're talking about, which is awareness? Mm -hmm. 
I would say awareness is getting in front of as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And so going out for small nonprofits that are serving locally, doing presentations locally, talking to different groups of people, rotaries, sertomas, there's all sorts of different groups that you can that you can talk to, talking to the local newspaper, getting word out about what your organization is doing, coming up with ideas that are timely, newsworthy, and relevant so that newspapers and, and publications will pick up information about the organization, trying to do research and, and really more grassroots things rather than formally bringing in a PR agency and, and doing a big branding where you pick your colors and you pick your themes and your um, all of that type of of thing. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned a, a minute ago about how, especially for a smaller or a newer nonprofit, over the first couple of years, their identity of who they are and what they're doing may change. So if you're a, a new nonprofit and you set out with this mission and, and you get your you build the awareness within your community and then you do start to grow and maybe tweak things a little bit. How do you how do you do that? How do you make changes like that without alienating the people who you've connected with from the start? Does that make sense? It does. And I think making sure that people are engaged in the changes. So if it's a small nonprofit, it's easier to have a community meeting where you can bring people together and, and talk about the changing needs of the organization. And if you can't do a community meeting, then making sure to do a little bit of education and materials that, you're, that we're sending out information about how the needs in the community are changing, why that means that the approach might need to change, and making sure that we're not jumping 20 steps ahead of everybody else. We need to, and this is a mistake I, I make a lot, is is deciding, okay, this is what we need to do and this is what we're going to do, and I forget that everybody hasn't been there through that five, ten hours of processing time where I came to the conclusion that I did. So when nonprofits change, making sure that we bring people up to speed on that thinking that went into it, not assuming that everybody's going to be as excited about it as we are because they haven't been with us. So helping to create experiences where, where donors and supporters can feel like They've been through it, they understand, they get it. And then, of course, for large supporters and for people who are significantly involved in the organization, making sure that they are personally, um, more personally kept up to date. So a phone call, a visit, making sure that we're, again, helping people stay up to speed on what we're doing. So just basically like in every other aspect of fundraising, it comes down to communication and I guess transparency, just letting people know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and really not kind of throwing any big surprises at them. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, Margaret, could I do a follow-up question with, on, with Kirsten? No. Good. Okay, no, no. <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, <laughs> I control the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, so, don't let him do it, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten, one of the things that I see with small nonprofits, and I think it's because founders are so s scrappy and wonderful and energetic, is that they get bored with their messaging. And you, you alluded to this a little bit about, you know, turning the corner and leaving people off the apple cart, sort of, you didn't communicate the process. Are there ways that you can... Um, you know, maybe some of the, somebody watching right now is thinking that they're going to just throw out their whole their whole messaging because they're going to do this new thing. Um, or there are there are there clues that you can use, or, or are there rubrics that people can um, kind of touch base, go back to before they change their their messaging as they're trying to gain awareness so that there's traction and so that the reporters know, oh, if there's something in this community, this is the person I need to talk to. Uh, because there's that long history of staying on the same message. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of questions that are in there. Probably. But the, um, <laughs> I think the, the biggest point that I can make is that we get bored of our messaging a lot quicker than anybody else does. And I think you may have written a blog post about that recently. But um, yeah. we get bored <laughs> of our messaging quicker, so we feel like it has to change, it has to adapt, it has to, to, to grow. But if the needs in the community are, sa are the same, we do need to have a reason behind it to change our approach and, and change what we're doing. So the more consistent we can get with our messaging, 
the more possible it is that reporters will take us seriously, will pick up our messaging, will do the things that um, will help our organization grow. So definitely would advise against changing just for the sake of changing, if that answers your question. I think so. Thanks. Well, I remember reading uh, where someone, actually a few people, I've heard them say that when you're getting bored with your messaging, when you're getting tired of it, then it's just starting to sink in with the people you're That's communicating right. with. So mm -hmm. when, when you get that ennui and you think it's time to change, realize that, that people are just now getting familiar with it. That's what um, I had heard. <laughs> so. yeah. Hey, bonus points for using ennui. That was like, <laughs> nice. That's a $75 word right there. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> I don't think we use the word ennui enough. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I have a, a bit more of a general question. Um, how do I know, as a CEO, that a fundraiser is doing his or her job? Uh. I, I, I <laughs> love that question. <laughs> um, can I start? Because I it. work a lot with um, development directors and you know, I, I think that one of the things that a CEO needs to pay attention to over time is, are they actually raising any money? And it seems so obvious, but it's completely, in so many cases, um, ignored. And I ask um, development directors basic information, you know, tell me how your donor base has grown and how many donors do you have and what's your retention rate and you know what what's the return on particular um, approaches that you're using and what's your plan for development and they can't answer those questions and for me if you've got a development director who can't do that basic stuff they either need serious training because you hired them without that equipment or maybe they're not the right people for your organization you know what, Gail, um, one of the other things, too, that I wonder about sometimes is, and I see this from the auction angle, is I will be working, in some groups, I'm working with a development director, and she turns everything over to a special events person who I is my liaison in that, and the special events person is really who I'm directing with. In other cases, the development director is doing special events, mm -hmm. and raising money, and managing volunteers, and, 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 and uh, I, I, I wonder if it comes down to even some Something more basic is like what 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 does that mean? What if at, right. the, at the crux of the job description, what am I doing? Is my job to raise money? Because if so, what can I outsource or what should we not be doing? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's not really a question as much as a commentary on how many things get thrown onto the plate as to what you're supposed to be doing. So yeah, I think um, having worked in small shops, it's really and you know everybody can jump in on this one really being clear about a plan, right? So how, in fact, are we going to raise the dollars that we need to do? And then sticking to that as it makes sense, and I'm not saying being a slave to it, because you obviously have to adapt as things change and opportunities arise, but really understanding what kind of efforts needed in what ways and moving that forward is, is critical. And in small shops, especially for that one person, you have to do a lot of staging. So gee, I'm not running the special event from January through March, so in that time then I'm going to do a good portion of my major giver cultivation. So you really have to think seasonally about the work that you're doing so that you can get it all in. Um, and then, you know, back to, to board members and other volunteers, how can I mobilize other people to help support me in this work and how can I mobilize them in smart ways um, to make that happen? I don't know well, if others want to jump yeah, in. Yeah, no, on, one of the things yeah. I want to, I, I, I totally agree that it, are they raising money is a big thing. Um, having been the person that wore all the hats uh, in a one-person shop, one of the things, though, that a development director needs to be doing is communicating effectively with their CEO. Mm. To, uh, because if it's just a money focus, not only do you burn out your fundraiser even more quickly, your fundraising professional, but um, you burn out your donors. It becomes a slash and burn type oh, of fundraising yeah, exactly. that's not sustainable. So um, I, I remember walking my board through how many touches was I doing for cultivation, how many asks was I doing, and then how much stewardship was happening. 
because I needed them to see that you need to plant the seeds, you need to tend the seeds, and then you get to harvest the seeds. But you then need to take care of the soil for the next seeds to be planted. And I wanted them to have a whole uh, perspective of that. So I guess another uh, metric that I'd highly recommend CEOs figure out or ask their director, development directors are, is what's our donor retention? We, we've all read the studies, uh, the, the national statistic for the United States anyway, is that donor, uh, charities are losing 73% of their donors every year. So if you took a list of 20 new donors from last year, you just take a Sharpie and cross out 15 of those names because they're not going to give again. Um, and that's not doing a good job, but that's because we're so focused on new money that we forget the old money. It's like we bought a t-shirt instead of building a relationship. Ah, I bought that t-shirt. i got to go buy another t-shirt. No, you got to take care of this. This isn't a T-shirt; it's a person in there. I also think you know, in the um, recent report, the report that was released last year by Compass Point and the Haas Foundation called "Underdeveloped," which was yeah. the state of fundraising in the nonprofit sector. There is a lot of need for CEOs to look at themselves in this process <laughs> and to say, you know, Ooh. am I really <laughs> supportive of this effort? How comfortable am I? Because Hands down, the executive director, CEO, has got to be the number one fundraiser in the organization. Preach Absolutely, it. Yes. it is. <laughs> you know, it is not not anything that they can pass off or not. And in, in many cases, the development director is the orchestrator of the executive director. Right? They're the enabler. They're the person who makes that person successful in the work that they are going to do. But donors want to talk to the top. In, in many, many cases. You know, that's who they want to hear from, that's who they need to be credible, that person who really embodies the passion and the mission of the organization. And so a lot of that question about are we successful also starts with, gee, am I the CEO making us successful? Nice. Um, one, one thing I'd like to add, too, is the importance of interim measurements and being able to track and see, okay, if we know that we make so many contacts, we're going to get so many gifts. So let's say we have 10 one-on-one -on -one asks, maybe three or four of them will say yes and figure out the interim measurements that we need to be tracking. And and both, both Mark and Gail had alluded to this, but identifying what specifically interim measurements need to be accomplished to be able to focus to accomplish the end result, which is money. So backing it up a little, because sometimes it might take six to 12 months really for a, or 18 months for a fundraising program to be able to mature. But being able to track those interim measurements can be a good gauge as we're moving forward that yes, we're gonna reach our goal because these interim measurements have been reached. Um, I have a question that is sort of general, but I think that it's something that um, people who work at small nonprofits would like to hear addressed because they deal with it all the time. The reality of being a fundraiser in a small nonprofit, um, time management and burnout and, and things like that. Can anybody offer advice um, just for, for how to deal with that? Some practical advice for dealing with the fact that you are responsible for just about everything and you're probably never off duty. I'd love to just, as a Franklin Covey guy, to train executive coach, one of the things that I had to do for my own sanity was uh, create a spreadsheet, and I logged my time. One of the things that we don't do uh, for our nonprofits when we're doing special events is we don't track our own staff time. So most of our no events really aren't raising any money. They're raising awareness. They're raising you know volunteer opportunities, other things. But when they when you factor in salaries and benefits, they're not necessarily raising money. But what at the end of each month, I just sit down and on my spreadsheet have major gifts. Uh, I think maybe capital projects, but I might have mixed those together. Special events, annual fund, grants, because I was responsible for that. Uh, and then I'd put things in like community stuff. There were things that I needed to do, rotary and other things that were important for my non nonprofit because I was the only external face to this nonprofit. So I put that in there. And then I also had a category for internal meetings because there are so many time suckers mm -hmm. that were internal meetings. And it turned out 40% of my time was going to being a good team member. Um, even though it was, I was supposed to, I was getting graded on how much money was coming in, but 40% of my time was adult learning, leadership opportunities, leadership institutes, uh, management meetings, all those other things. But I, I was keeping my own record before they were telling me to so that I could just know where my time was going and then if I got pushed by my CEO, I'd be able to pull out the sheet and just say, 
And I didn't keep hours. That's a, that's a little trick, too. I put percentages because hours fluctuated, and I wanted to keep that kind of flux because there were 60-hour weeks, and I didn't think there had to be only 40-hour weeks. Sometimes it could be 35, but it's usually 60 or 80, so I wanted to put percentages in there personally. So that's what I did was kept track of it every month, just kind of totaled it up. Anyone else like to add to that or share some insight? I think another thing that I always, always think every development person should do is get themselves a circle of peers. You know, many yeah. of us belong to the Association of Fundraising Professionals or other professional associations. And when I started my career, that was so important and continues to be, to know that you have other people who get it, who understand you, who have more experience or, you know, less, but they have different approaches, can mentor you, can be there. And I have always found that the fundraising community um, of peers is a very embracing and nurturing community. And yeah. you've got to create that for yourself. Anyone else? Yeah, two things that I would add. One is to schedule time to think. A lot of times mm -hmm. we fill up our schedules, but we forget that we need time to think and plan for, for what we're going to do. So if we block out that time and say, okay, even if it's just half an hour or an hour a week, to schedule that time to think and plan and identify what the top priorities are for the organization. And then rather than to look at a large to-do list, sure, write all those things down, but then identify the top three things that need to be done, three important projects each, each week, and try to fit those in. And if we're just focusing on three at a time, it's a lot easier and we can get a lot more accomplished if we're really focusing. Sherry, would you like to add anything? Uh, well, let's see. We had Mark say tracking the time via percentages. Gail weighed in with group support. We've got scheduling time to think. I think the only thing left is massage and manicure. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing that after this uh, hangout, oh, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> okay, we, um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I'm going to pull a typical interview roundup kind of thing, but can each of you um, just give us one quick word of advice to the people who are reading the book? Um, Kristen, let's start with you. Kirsten, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I would say the biggest thing to do is to not try to accomplish everything at once. Just, mm -hmm. just scan through, figure out where your organization needs some help on, and start with that chapter. You don't need to read the whole thing at once and, and swallow it at once. Just focus in on one thing. Gail? Hmm, stole mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> find, the find, the, find the place that you feel is your strength and, and start there because you'll do better at what you're strongest at than get to your weaknesses later. But work with your strengths and move that forward. Great. Sherry? I don't have anything to add. Those are great. <laughs> I'm always a big believer in having fun. That's my big belief. And when it stops being fun, I start moving on. But uh, so, but both of those, both Kirsten and Gail, I think those are they're tying into it very nicely. Because if you start with something you're good at, you're usually enjoying it because you're better at it. So uh, I'd have to weigh in with both those. Mark will probably have something different to say though. So I'll turn it over to him. Well, we will end with Mark. <laughs> oh no! Because I just want to say what they said. Um, <laughs> buy the book. Buy it. <laughs> EssentialFundraisingHandbook.com. That's true. So, it won't um, be helpful if you don't have it, right? Yeah, and and um, I guess just since I started down the pitchman and it's pitman, but I sound like pitchman. Um, there is a special offer right now for the book launch. So if you're watching this, you go to you know Central Handbook, EssentialFundraisingHandbook.com. There's a discount on the book. Um, and if you're watching this later and the discount's not there, it's still totally worth it. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess. Don't don't. I, I think Gail's point about reaching out to other people and developing a support network. Usually, those of us that are in fundraising are the weirdos at our organizations. We're just the oddballs because we actually like doing this in some level, some aspect of this. And um, finding out, finding those other weirdos in your community. Sometimes it's better to do it across country. There are Facebook groups, there are professional associations, there are informal ad hoc things, there are coaches, consultants, whatever. Finding people that you can call up when you're at a high or a low and just say, remind me, I'm not crazy, right? Or if I'm crazy, I'm not the only one that's crazy this way. Uh, and that can really help you avoid the burnout that's talked about in that study called Underdeveloped that talks about how 50% you know, of CEOs want to fire their fundraiser and 75% of the fundraisers want to quit. 
<laughs> that doesn't have to be your reality. Great. I think we're just about out of time. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. And there's the book again. Don't forget. Uh, and I guess uh, you can follow along with the conversation at on uh, Twitter at Essential, Essential Fundraising using that hashtag. I'm sure the conversation will keep going. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thanks Margaret. You. Thank you, Margaret.